Hello? Take bets on how many minutes in when I kick that over. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, some thoughts I have about assessment. And I'm going to start, oh, quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to start by framing a problem that I see a misguided effort of people trying to control learning. Control how learning is defined. Control how learning happens. And uh, worst of all, control how learning is measured. I think people try to see it as this very linear, isolated, singularly causal process, when in fact it's this giant mess of stuff that happens. And uh, this is my self-drawn diagram. It's not nearly as sophisticated as uh, Trung Lee's earlier with the paint and stuff. This is my closest uh, thing to it. Um, but I guess you know, my perspective on learning is that from the moment you're born uh, to the moment you end, uh, you're learning. It, it's just always happening. It's just that the settings change and the types of learning that take place uh, might vary. Uh, and so that leads really to a problem with how we understand assessment and really how we use the word assessment. And I think the biggest mistake is to confuse grades and assessment. And I think they're completely different things. <laughs> I, the, the only, you know, one of the best uses of grades uh, around here are when you see them uh, on restaurant windows. I think they're useful there. But if learning is this incredibly complex thing, how is it possible to reduce all of these magical things that happen to a single letter or a single set of numbers? I mean, it just it mystifies me. Uh, you know, I've been trying to position myself at, at an intersection of formative assessment uh, and emerging technology. And even when I hear formative assessment being thrown around, you know, I see it as feedback and guidance and learning about where uh, people are uh, in their learning development. And you know, as I look at this intersection, I see clickers and graphs and longitudinal data and heat maps and crazy heat maps. And like, are we trying to get to the point where teachers have to be able to look at something like this and be able to see where a kid is in their learning? I mean, if you're going to try to capture all of the points in somebody's learning journey, you have to have tons and tons of data points to really measure it. And you're really just kind of depersonalizing the whole learning process. And I'm glad that Audrey referenced a Terminator in that kindergarten uh, cop shot before maybe you, know, you didn't catch the red eye, but it, it seems like the, the cyborg or the robot teacher is the only person who can look at a kid, see where they are, you know. Oh, hi kids, how are you doing? I know where you are. And you know, like then maybe that's how they kind of assess learning. And I, I just don't, that's not where I'm interested in focusing my energy. Um, you know, when I was a, t a math teacher, I always used to get this question, you know, when is our next test? When is our next assessment? Is this going to be on the next test? Uh, that's me there with the crazy hair. And uh, I used to say, and they would roll their eyes, well, I'm assessing you right now. Every moment that we're together is an assessment. Even moments when we're not together, it's part of my assessing where you are as a student and as a learner. And, you know, uh, they don't really like that. But, but it's true. I'd be like, I'm watching you right now. I've just assessed you. And so I've been trying to figure out a way to define these types of interactions, all of the informal things that you know, might unintentionally or intentionally happen. And these are the things that really paint the picture of where people are in their, in their learning journey. And I see the role of educational technology not for trying to depersonalize and create these data points, but rather to strengthen relationships between teachers and learners uh, and just all sorts of people. So I'm going to shift here. Hold these thoughts. I'm going to talk about things that I think are awesome. Does everybody know what that block is? Yeah. So the, the, the other day I was talking to some uh, middle school students, and uh, you know, they were showing me like these crazy like lava things and chain reactions. It was really amazing stuff. And I was like, all right, I'll be really impressed if one of you can build a functional fire station to deal with all of this chaos that you're brewing in your Minecraft world. And in 10 minutes, a student built me a working fire station. I was like, that's awesome. And then a few weeks later, I found out uh, on the internet that a whole worldwide group of people have recre recreated the entire world of Game of Thrones to scale in Minecraft. <laughs> I'm like, that's awesome. And then yesterday, uh, or on, is today Saturday? Yeah, yesterday, a student emailed me a picture of a tree he made. I said, like, awesome. Or somebody took Grand Theft Auto and turned it into Back to the Future. 
That's awesome. And this, this to me is really awesome. It's a toaster. It's awesome. It was on fire. It was awesomer. The reason it was on fire was because of uh, a couple of kids at the school uh, where I worked before, uh, when they got the toaster in the building, were like, let's make grilled cheeses. And the, you know, I don't know if you are familiar with conveyor belt toasters like in hotels. They're not made or designed uh, to handle grilled cheese sandwiches, but yet, you know, how would they know that? Of course you can make a grilled cheese. Brilliant. You know, it wasn't foolish. They, they saw the parameters and the environment around them and they tested it and they tried to do something with it. So, you know, those examples that I was just showing, to me, are examples of tools and environments that have been created. And the people who made them, you know, of course, they have their own intent of what those things are going to be used for. But the beauty in the design is that they're open enough for people to try to really push the boundaries of what might be possible. So I made a kind of a quest to try to find out tools that I could use to support my teaching that I thought you know, kind of had that or supported that same type of experience. Um, you know, and those experiences, they can't be measured. You know, they can't be graded. They just kind of happen. And you grade, I mean, excuse me, and you, you, you look at them and they can't be graded and you, know, you can only guide and support them. And so I started a blog trying to like find apps and tools that were out there. And it's not a popular blog, nobody goes there. <laughs> so I wrote this post. <laughs> Zero comments. Nobody liked it. One tweet by me. <laughs> and the amazing thing that happened, it's just an incredible series of events that from this post, the next day, because of that tweet, the developers wrote me back and were like, oh, we're interested in some of the things you're doing. And over the next two years, we formed a partnership. It's, it's my two partners who are in Poland. And I've never met them in person, yet we've been working together for two years. And you know, my daughter was born. And then about 10 days later, <laughs> I gave birth to this app. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the app, really. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit quickly about the intent that you know, I have ideas of how I'm trying to um, capture these informal conversations and dialogue and support relationships between, between actual people. Um, and I know people look at some of the technology and say, oh, there's this use or there's that use, and you know, maybe that's not so good. Maybe it's perpetuating problems. But I try to think of it as being neutral. You put it out there, and you let people do with it, uh, do with it what they want and see what kind of good things happen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some of my, uh, my precious time here just to, to share just, just one video that came up in my like, uh, narcissistic Googling of myself over the summer. Today, you have come into our journey across the solar system. With our best pilot, to be some audio. Bruce. You can imagine a, a very cute we Australian boy talking. We are currently approaching the sun. Some, uh, it music. is the center of the solar system. It is a big ball of nuclear explosions called fission. It provides light to the Earth and is really, 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 really big and really, really, really hot. So oh, I'll show the rest of it in a second. So the reason that this made me happy was I never made an instruction manual on how to build something like this. And I have no idea what purpose or what reason this young man decided to put this thing together. But he somehow stumbled upon something um, that I had created and made something else out of it that I didn't, you know, I don't know how he did some of the things in here, and I just thought that was really neat. Um, I, he goes through all of the planets in the solar system, and uh, he, here's, here's how it continues. This is the asteroid belt. It divides the solar system into the terrestrial planets and the gas giants. It is also where you hide your Millennium Falcon when you're being chased by the Imperial Starfleet. Thank you for coming on this year's journey. I am on holiday for the next two months, so please find your own way home. Over and out, Captain Bruce. So my final uh, thing that I'll show on the screen up here is uh, just this a simple idea that don't try to control the learning experience. Just let things happen and guide and support people. Thank you.